true stories about remote abandoned locations rich in history. Come with us in our travels from state to state, if you dare. <laughs> Hello? Gina, there is a beehive over there. Do you see that in the hole? Buckle up, buttercup. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. I believe in the, in the evil in human nature. This is a wicked, wicked world. And uh, in a wicked world, you, wicked people are born. Hi. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> I know. Good we're, morning. You know Good what? afternoon. We're I don't actually, even know what time it is. We're actually recording kind of early this morning. Yeah. But welcome to 50, welcome Saints, to 50 of Saints of Madness. Oh. I'm Shannon. I'm Gina. Yes. Um, so today, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Um, today we have an interview with a pretty amazing person. The man. The legend. Uh, Mr. Gil Carrillo. He, um, he was a... He's retired. He retired in 2010. He was a detective for the Homicide Bureau, and he was the lead detective on the Night Stalker case. I can't even believe he's going to take the time out to yeah. talk to us. Like, I just... <clears throat> I know. I don't know. It's just... Oh. Yeah, he was, um, he was so, so sweet when I reached out to him. He was like, sure, no problem. We had talked originally um, before Christmas, and so he said... Um, sure just you know let's get through the holidays or whatever and then gina can get anybody like we just did a patreon episode that literally the guest said i would not be here if it wasn't for gina like gina can get anybody on our show no yes i can't can. not anybody <laughs> not anybody but we'll nevertheless see. um i have been so excited about this like i couldn't stop talking about it um many of you know like we've talked about my fascination with just serial killers in general, but just with the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez in general, just because, you know, Shannon and I both lived through that time as a child. Yeah. And so I think it just hits a little deeper when you've actually lived through it and you remember it and what a scary time it was. And so I, um, so we asked Gail to just kind of go through, you know, it, obviously it would have been a, 10 hour episode if we I, asked for all the details yeah and I didn't want to stop talking to him I could talk to him for days because he's just so fascinating and um so we just asked him to you know kind of briefly go over you know different things the cases um his experience how it affected his family and um you know different things like that so he was he's such a lovely person and he was nice enough to to do this for us and so we hope that you enjoy it so without further ado here we go mr Here's gil carrillo well hey listen good morning i'm happy good to morning. be here with you i'm happy to be here with you and thank you for the invitation and i understand you want to talk today about a little bit about the night stalker case something a case that i'm very familiar with yes i believe you are <laughs> and and so i've been asked to you know just kind of encapsulate everything that went on in a case within a two minute period of time, which right. is totally impossible. But we'll, just... <laughs> well, here it was. It was uh, March 17th, 1985, St. Patrick's Day. I was at home at 10 30 at night. Actually, it was 10 40. Uh, they called me up and they said, Gil, you got a murder at 8510 Village Lane, City of Rosemead. And so I went. Village Lane just happens to be right off the 60 freeway, uh, not far right there in the city where. Montebello and City of Rosemead, they all meet, come together in Monterey Park. And so I went. And that's where we had uh, the first murder in the modern series. And that was Dale Okazaki. Dale Okazaki was shot. Her roommate, Maria Hernandez, was also shot. Dale lost her life. Maria Hernandez survived. Well, it's just like any other routine mundane murder that they send me out on. My partner meets me. There we go. And what we find is the uh, one victim has been shot. It's a condominium complex. The garage is attached to the living quarters. 
and Maria Hernandez arrived home, went to key her, opened the garage uh, with a garage door opener. As she's driving in, drives in, goes up to the door, keys her door. Just then, somebody makes a deliberate sound. She turns around in order to get her attention, and she sees a man walking at her point shoulder position. That's with two-handed holding the gun right in front of you when you're walking, you know, just walking around and <clears throat> coming right at her. The stargaze look in her eye, in his eyes. Uh, she had already hit the garage door closer on the wall, which means from the time that she hit the garage door opener, she had eight seconds for the garage door to close, and it would be entirely black in there, totally dark. It went dark. The gun went off. She went down to the ground. He then thought immediately, he will tell me later on, he thought he was dead. He thought he had shot him. So he, because his ears were ringing, it was totally black. He thought he was in hell. And then he opened up the door that had already been unlocked, pushed her body out of the way, and went inside the condo proper. Fortunately for Maria, when she put her hands in front of her face, she was holding a set of keys. The bullet struck the keys, entered her hand, and never exited. She ran out. She opened the garage door with a button, went outside. And as she's running down the alleyway, she hears a second gunshot. And then she realizes, oh, my God, my roommate, Dale. She runs around to the front of the apartment where she is surprised as Richard is because he's coming out the front door and she's going in the front door. They play a little cat and mouse game around a car uh, back and forth. And then finally, she just throws her hands up in the air and says, don't shoot me again. You've already shot me once. He put the gun by his side and walked away. He didn't run. He walked away. Uh, so that started it. Uh, while I was there conducting the investigation with my partner, uh, at that time, it was a gentleman by the name of Jim Mercer. And Jim and I were conducting the crime scene investigation when, <coughs> excuse me, we're silhouetted inside the living room area. And the deputy comes in and says, Gil, there's a lady out there uh, that wants to talk to you. She says she's a mother of Maria Hernandez. And I said, okay, I'll uh, just tell her, please give me a minute and I'll be right out, out there for her. Uh, because I was silhouetted and she's in the dark outside. I couldn't see her, but she could see me. And all of a sudden I see, I hear somebody say, Gilbert, is that you? And I'm sitting there saying, I'm Gilbert, but I'm too cool to be called Gilbert. I'm Gil now. And I said, yes, it is. She goes, it's me, Pauline. And I said, pumpkin? She said, yes. I said, oh, my God. This was a lady that was my neighbor. She, When I was growing up, she lived four doors down from me. Oh, my God. My parents had baptized her baby, who was Maria Hernandez. Oh, my God. And that had been 25 years prior. The last time I'd seen Maria, she was about six months old. They uh, had a baptism right after that, shortly after that. Uh, Pauline and her husband, uh, Johnny, they got divorced. She moved away. I never saw her again. <clears throat> she had since been remarried. And Maria grew up. And that was the beginning of the case. We'll find out the next morning that 50 minutes later in the city of Monterey Park, probably about two miles away by crow's flight from where we were, once Silent you got uh, shot and killed. And that one, uh, the neighbors who were the informants on the case thought it was a boyfriend-girlfriend fight. They were shouting. They saw the gunshots. They saw fighting. And then the guy takes off. So that started this reign of terror. We will later learn <clears throat> that there are 14 other, there are a total of 14 people killed during this investigation. The, the problem being from the very beginning is that I had a theory, and that's all it was because we had no physical evidence yet, uh, that one man was doing it. And the reason I had, I said one man with Maria Hernandez. Uh, we had just transformed from doing uh, 
old school police work, which was called identikits, and it was like an etch a sketch almost. You'd get clear acetate paper, you know, the one they use in overhead projection when you're in yes. college. Okay. Yeah. Well, those clear acetates had lines on them, and you'd lay one on top of the other. So one would be eyebrows, one would be eyes, lips, nose. You'd lay them all on top of each other, and then you'd take a Xerox of what you had, and now you had a solid something that looked like a picture. Wow. And so we sent, and we were in the transition doing identikit to staff artist, where we would send an artist to you and just sit there and say, tell me what he looked like. And they would start drawing. And then they'd show you, say, well, the cheeks were a little higher. So the artist would make cheeks a little higher. They did everything and they'd say, that looks like him. So we were right in the transition. And the staff artist stuff we saved, since it was new and more costly to do, we'd use it for murders and only where we thought we had a shot in uh, getting some kind of identification out of it. So we did, the next morning we had an artist go down and talk to Maria and she gave her rendition of what she saw. She told him he put it on the paper and now we had a drawing. I went down to the local sheriff's station, which was uh, not far from where the murder occurred. And that was uh, like my working home for a while. I went in there and I'm showing the detectives that that's, so, hey, this is who I'm looking for. And one of the guys that happened to be in the station, an old friend of mine, who also used that as his home, he used to work East L.A. Station as well. He was now working for Leighton Pricks. And he had gone out to do a drawing for uh, Identikit for a 12-year-old little girl in the city of Pico Rivera, which was also very close to where the murder was. Right. So... Uh, he came in, he says, Gil, hold that thought, went out to his car, brought in his identikit. And we put it next to my staff artist rendition, and it looked like the same guy. Oh, and the wow. physical descriptions were the same. Now, is this the, the one that was <laughs> released? The, the no, oh, no, okay. she, did, she didn't come in. Uh, all the kids were released here locally. This little girl, it was an attempt kidnapping, sexual assault. She got away from Richard. Okay. Oh, he didn't complete the act. So we had that. Uh, then on uh, March the 10th, oh, March the 29th, we had a double uh, Dale Okazaki. I mean, uh, Zara, right? Uh, uh, Maxine uh, Zazara. And they were killed in a double. Uh, right there, right off the 605 freeway next to Rose Hill Cemetery. For those this is the one that, that hit home for me because um, my childhood home is was in Whittier. Uh, and and I was I was 11 or 12 years old when this happened. And um, this is this is why I say that um, you're my hero, because oh. um, at that time when, you know, growing up, I was an only child and my parents never feared anything. I never saw my parents scared, afraid, nothing. Um, the fear that I saw my, not even my mom, but my dad, um, my house was booby trapped. Um, my dad had a ladder, a six foot ladder in my hallway with bowling balls piled up on them. So if somebody came down our hallway, he, um, he was a musician, and so he had drumsticks in front of our windows, so somebody broke into our windows. It was the most terrifying time in my life, and to see my mom and dad scared like that, um, it was like nothing. Like I, I, I never experienced anything like that before in my life, and, and I think that that's why um, I was so drawn to um, just finding out more about Richard Ramirez is because I lived through this and it was such a scary time, but the Zazara one is the one that really hit home for me is because it was so close. <laughs> well, Zazara was also very significant to us because in that one, uh, he cut her eyes out Yeah, and he left with her eyes, but what he did, that's the first time he had left a, an Avia footprint. And that was a very significant important part of the case because I can still today tell you that on 
January 9th, 1985, 1,356 pair of Abia Model 440s arrived in New York from Taiwan for distribution throughout the U.S., of which six pair ended up in the state of California, one pair ended up in Los Angeles. And yeah. so you can see that's almost like a fingerprint. Right. So going back, I, I was right. I'm saying, why did I say March of 10th? March of 10th, we found out that uh, prior to ours, there was a little girl, uh, a 10-year-old girl, Maria Sandoval, that was kidnapped. And there was an Avia footprint there. So by the end of March, I had, there was an also another case in Montebello, a child abduction. So I had three kitty cases. That's what I call them. Any minor, I was calling them kitty cases. Three kitty cases. And I had four murders. And I was intertwining. I was connecting them. So I wrote a search warrant uh, on April the 10th, connecting everything. And they're saying I was being called all kinds of names. When in reality, everything that I did on that case, the knowledge to work the case, I owe to one Dr. Robert Morneau. Dr. Bob Morneau was a professor at Cal State LA, retired FBI agent. And I took two semesters of advanced criminal investigation pertaining to sex crimes. And what I learned in that, in those classes, gave me the knowledge to work the case. And the thing, as an example, in Maria Hernandez's case, he's coming at her point shoulder with a gun pointed right at her face. There is a sexual deviancy that likes to sear this fear in someone's face. So they'll point a gun at you, never intending to kill you. They're just coming right at you. They want to see that scared look before they kill you or if you don't do what they say. And well, that happened to Murray Hernandez. Then when he went inside to kill Dale Okazaki, uh, Dale Okazaki, uh, she was down on the ground. He could have killed her anytime he wanted to. And he didn't. He waited till she put her hands on a countertop and lifted her head up because it was quiet. And she just put her hand right there and lifted her head up. So it's to see where he's at. And he was on the other side of the countertop waiting for her with a gun right on the counter. And when she did, he wanted to see the look on her face. And then he popped her right in the forehead. Silent you. 50 minutes later. He could have killed that lady sitting in the car and he didn't. And yet he drug her out of the car, shot her twice in the uh, abdomen area. Then left her. And at Zazara's, he left that footprint. And he cut out the eyes and he killed the, the male, which was the obstacle to get to his object of lust, which was the female. Right. And then you had the Avia footprint there. And then I found the Avia footprint through a photograph shown to me uh, from Montebello Police Department. And they had it because they had a five-year-old child kidnapped off a bus bench. And they were looking at it. And he showed uh, Dan Hibbard from Montebello. Call me, says, Gil, I want to show you this photo I just got from LAPD. This may be what you're looking for. And it was the Avia footprint on March 10th. And so I'm looking at the physical descriptions. I'm looking at this, the uh, footprint and the sexual activity of this guy, the rape, the scaring them to do this. And I'm saying this is a sexual deviance, one man. And yet, you know, criminal profiling, if you understand what that is, uh, they have. They used to have a big unit back in uh, behavioral science at Quantico, Virginia, for the FBI. And it's compiling of data from research on all historical crimes. And you're looking for a pattern. What kind of then mathematically they put it all together and they say, OK, your criminal should be uh, let, let us say we were in Needles, California, small town. OK, what you're looking for here is a male Caucasian who's been to prison, uneducated, and they'll give you a few things. And then you start narrowing down, eliminating everybody else. So in a small town, that's wonderful. You say that in LA, <laughs> where we have millions of people, not so much. But you can still eliminate a lot of people. But the difference being, it's all predicated on criminal history. Nobody, then or to this date, had ever been doing or has ever been caught doing 
what Richard was doing. Wow. So it didn't fit a criminal profile. And so even my guys, and I understand why my guys wouldn't believe it. Uh, I don't understand why some people, both in my department and outside my department, were calling me all kinds of names because I was nothing but a young punk, a uh, young Mexican punk trying to make a name for himself. <laughs> and that was uncalled for, but it's okay because I won in the end. You know, I was exactly. I I was right in the end. So the cases were developing, and, and I wasn't handling all the cases, uh, but I monitored every one of them very. I could at that time I could recite date, times, addresses, date of birth. I there I I knew their cases intimately, and finally the case went on. There was uh, another one in May. We had absolutely nothing in April. We had another one back in Monterey Park in May. And then the end of May, the beginning of June, we had one in Monrovia. Then we went up to the city of Glendale. And uh, it just, they kept bouncing all around. And once again, they were, it, it was totally inconsistent. His only consistency was his inconsistency. Because right. sometimes he used... Uh, guns, sometimes he used knives, sometimes he uses shot foot, sometimes he used blunt force trauma. Uh, there was just uh, manual and ligature strangulation, sexual assault, sodomy, vaginal rape. It, it was, he did everything. But it really wasn't until the morning of July uh, the 5th. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, the name Giselle Lavinier. Yes, I have. Uh, Giselle Labanier uh, looked like something right out of a movie. We were at uh, a house in Sierra Madre, a young teenage girl. She was 16 years old, had been beaten and left for dead inside her bedroom. And so we, unlike a lot of things that you see on TV, where the homicide cops go right into the bedroom and right into the room where the body's at and start looking around. Uh, we peeked around a corner, saw what was there, saw the crime scene. We didn't go inside. We had Giselle Lavigne and her staff come out. It may have been Steve Renteria with her that day. Uh, she went in and we waited in the living room while she did her hocus pocus with her crime lab equipment. And then she came into the living room and said, fellas, we're in her little white, white, lab coat her hair was in a bun and her glasses and she walks in and she says fellas found something that may be of interest to you and we walked in there and there on the pink comforter was a bloody avia footprint and my partner salerno and i had hooked up on june the 28th by this time my regular partner was off off duty because he was ill and so frank uh, had asked to be my partner. He had asked me, and then he asked to put us together. He wanted me as his partner. We got Patty Lane Higgins on June the 28th, which is right in the city of Arcadia, right next to Sierra Madre. We got that one on uh, June the 28th. On the 2nd of July, we got another one in Arcadia, a lady by the name of Mary Cannon. And then on the 5th, we had the teenage girl and we went up there and I looked at the footprint and I said, kiss my ass. And he, my partner then, Frank Salerno, said, yeah, kiss your ass. We walked back in the living room and he says, okay, let me know everything you've got in your head. And where I cited every one of the murders and what I've been tracking, what we did. He called the captain that day and said, hey, we got a sincere murder. We need to get on this hot. And so that's when the big task force started. And uh, it was, that was on July the 5th. Uh, we had another one in LA County on August 8th in the city of Diamond Bar. And uh, he was captured, arrested August 31st of 1985. I just want, um, what were the total number of victims? That we had a total of four, 14 murders. I can't tell you how many victims Here's the problem with counting victims and how stuff like that. And how many counts did they pile against them? It's easy to say 
14 murders. That means 14 people lost their life. But the way they break down the counts of the charges is one count of burglary, one count of, you know, sexual assault, one with a gun, a gun enhancement. You know, there's so many charges. And if there's three people in the house, they're all victims, but they may not have died. So I can't tell you how many victims uh, there were, and I can't tell you how many surviving victims there were. Uh, I can remember some of Sophie Dickman, uh, who was on July the 7th, uh, she was at that time, she was a 65-year-old lady and worked for the uh, Los Angeles County General Hospital. She worked the psychiatric ward. She was a tough old gal. She was really nice. I loved her. Uh, she was more concerned with don't let her cats get out of the house. You know, that's what, and when she had, when, after she was raped, she was left handcuffed to a, four, to a poster bed. She drug it over to the window and started calling for the, her neighbor across the street who happened to be a deputy at that time herself. It was Deputy Arthur who worked in our crime lab, who had been on some of the night stalker cases with me. And she called over and ironically, Linda had just had her husband murdered a month before. So she was there with friends at her house. Uh, Miss Sophie Dippin yelled out the window for Mrs. Arthur, Mrs. Arthur. And they came and they discovered her Monterey Park came down and he was using these cheap handcuffs on her. And so they had, it looked more like a jewelry, jewelry box key than a real handcuff key. And so they called every cop in Monterey Park, come on up there with their keys, see if they had one that would open it. And nobody had the cheap handcuff. And she said, well, call the deputies from East Los Angeles. Not she, but one of their command staff said, call East LA, have them start sending their people up here. And she just said, oh, damn it. Why don't you just call the fire department, come get them down here to cut this thing off, get me to the hospital so I can be examined. Stop fooling <laughs> around. <laughs> so, and she was... She was a tough old lady, I'm telling you. She was a sweetheart. And when it came time, after he's in custody, she says, I'll go to court and testify, but you better give me at least three days because I need to get to the beauty salon. If I don't go to the beauty salon, you ain't getting me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So she was sweet. Um, One of the things that stood out to me when I saw your presentation um, like four years ago um was the effect that this had on your wife and your family. And that, that really, um, that really stuck with me because sometimes we don't think about how that affects your family. Like to us, you're just a detective and you're out there doing your work. And sometimes you forget, like these people have, have families at home that are just, I mean, I can't even imagine. I can't imagine. Sometimes we forget that we have families. Yeah. It, just, it really is. Uh, in all honesty and sincerity, I tell you that during the case, I told her, you have the house and the kids. I have to catch the killer. I was gone. We were putting in 16, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And my captain is quoted in the Times as saying that, you know, that we were in there that long. And I really didn't care about anything that was going on at home. My wife was frightened. I remember calling one day to check on her, and she was at my parents' house. And I asked, how are the kids? And she said she had caught my 13-year-old daughter crying in the bedroom. And I said, what was wrong? And she said, I asked her, and she said, nothing. She said, no, tell me the truth. What's going on? And she says, I just want my dad home. I want him back. And I said, okay, I got to go. And it, it brought tears to my eye. That's my daughter wanting me home and I'm not there. And I slammed the phone down and I started profanities. I just started cussing up a storm and not at my kid, but at my wife. Why is she telling me this stuff? I already have enough stress on me from the case. And now she's going to bring... I don't need to hear that stuff right now, but I couldn't tell her that. Yeah, of course. We watched the documentary together. I cried. We both cried. And we both laughed. 
I did more than her. Uh, funny things I remembered, but after it was all over, I asked for forgiveness. And I told her I was sorry. I apologized to her because I was trying to call, control two things at one at once, but the one thing I couldn't control was her fear. And so she went through an awful lot. I had no idea how truly frightened she was. What a sissy. She couldn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I had to apologize and ask her for forgiveness. Um, I have a question just because um, we do cover a lot of. Um, I'm sorry. You, know, you sound like the girl from Sweaty Balls. I'm <laughs> You know, it's so funny because I get, I get compared to Molly Shannon a lot, like no. way before this, a lot I of people. I, I... <laughs> okay. What's your question? I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. No. Cause I do. I get compared to her a lot. You can ask us questions. After. Yeah, you can ask. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, because we cover, we just kind of, you know, we cover, um, a lot of cases, like we just, you know, repeat them and we talk about them. And the one thing that um, we know that we always touch on is that the families, you know, they want answers quickly. And um, especially, you know, the families of the victims and stuff and how, you know, they feel like it's not moving fast enough or things aren't happening. And I just want like your take on like, just let us know a little bit on what's happening in the background to give them kind of a peace of mind to know that they're because we always say like we we know that they're working on the cases we know we take the the detectives and the police officers take this seriously just what it, why does it take years and years for these things to happen sometimes okay i i will tell you the best part about being a homicide investigator is to the point where you could tell uh a loved one we now have the person responsible for the death of your loved one in custody. That's the best day. And when you get that conviction, it's a, it's a wonderful feeling. The worst part about being a homicide investigator is having information that you can't share with the family. That, And that's for the integrity of the investigation. So if I tell you one thing that nobody else knows, the first thing you can do is tell your sidekick right there. But you got to keep it between us. Nobody can know. And it's too late. You've already let it out of the bag. So a when you promise to keep it a secret, there's only two kinds of secrets. Secret that really isn't going to hurt anybody. So you can go ahead and let it out. Just a cute little secret. Or a secret that is so hot, you can't hold it inside. You've got to share this with somebody. The minute you share it with somebody, we have we've, you've lost all control, just like we've lost control. And so if somebody next week says, hey, this is what I heard, well, where did the genesis of that story come from? And you trace it all the way back to the person we gave it to in the beginning. So therefore, we do not share information our goal is to gather the facts and enough evidence to apprehend somebody. And once we apprehend them, we don't let go. If we do apprehend them quickly, we have 48 hours by law in which to get them before a magistrate. And so if we don't, they go free. They walk out. And now our hand, they already know what we know. They already know that we're on to them. So we won't at least hear within, I will make it even narrow, narrower, sheriff's homicide. We don't like to make an arrest until we know that there's going to be a conviction. Along those lines, a very recent case, I applaud. And, and what happens, let me see this first. What happens around the United States is there are many small towns that don't get a bunch of murders. So when they get out there, they don't know how to handle them. They don't know how to handle the press. They think they got to bow. They got to answer all these questions. It's a small town, and they give up the ghost. John Benet Ramsey, little girl. If you followed that case from the beginning, everybody, including the press, went inside that house. The neighbor was in there. The father discovered the body after the cop in and out. It was impossible to get a 
a virgin crime scene at that. So the case was botched from day one. An investigator's nightmare. But they don't get a bunch of murders up there either. So they didn't know. It's not like they're saying it's intentional. Hey, come on in. We're going to show you around. Yeah, we're not going to do any harm. No, they don't know. Every time you walk from the outside in, you take something from outside that crime scene into the crime scene. And every time you leave, you take something from the crime scene out with you, whether you know it or not. And people, everyday people are not ready for that. The second thing is, in the most recent case, the killing of the four college students up in Moscow. I was going to bring that. Yes. My, my hat goes off. I applaud law enforcement there because they did not bow or succumb to the pressure of the press and to the one father who was really getting in the way because every time he raises his head, now he's got an attorney. Now he wants to hire a private investigator. I want to answer that one. Well, they're spending time talking to him. It's taking time away from what they should be doing. And that's working the case. He was a pain. And, and my hand, I'm so sorry for the loss of his daughter. And I know he felt he was doing everything, but law enforcement did everything the right way. They did not say anything until after the arrest. And even then they minimally, and then they started letting out a little bit, but they did it the right way. That's what you should have done. That's what led to a successful arrest. And that's what eventually is going to lead to a successful prosecution. So you just can't tell them. We do see that sometimes, like sometimes we'll watch TikToks or something on some crime scene or, and it's like, oh, um, you had one recently where it's like, you had seen one where they said like, oh, I got this information from a, and they like blast out who they got the information from. Yeah. And it's like, that's, it's correct. <laughs> you say like you shouldn't really share that information because it will circle back to you and that's their job, you yeah, know? And you, you just can't let it out. And now with social media, we have so many uh, junior super sleuths. I was just going to ask you that. What's, what's your take on that? Because I feel like, especially with this Idaho case, you know, and it, chair detectives. Yeah. And it wasn't until the end. And I, I just thought, you know what? Like you said, hats off to them because they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly what they had and nothing was said. And I'd yet, love to shake that, that boss's hand over there. Yep, what a great I, job. Yeah. And, and to see all of the, um, you know, all the things on social media where these people are like, it's solved, it's solved. It's this person, it's that person. And they, I mean, the stuff that just goes on, like, what's your take on that? Like, cause I don't back, pay attention then, to it. yeah, I don't cause pay back, to it. you know, I, I feel like like in the eighties and nineties, we didn't There's, have that. There is some, you know, uh, Bob Morneau, once again, my professor, he said, <clears throat> Excuse me. In order to work these cases, you have to have an infinite amount of understanding. So you have to understand why people do the things they do. You don't condone them. I can understand why Richard killed the women, some women. Richard says if they didn't acquiesce to his commands, they died. Okay, I can understand it. Well, next time, do what he says, and he won't kill you. Do I condone what he did? Absolutely not. So you have to understand that there are people out there right now. I've just learned recently within the last couple of months, uh, there's some kid is 15 years old who started, I don't know what you call them, a blog or a thread or whatever you, you call them, where he says that uh, Frank Salerno and Gil Carrillo both lied uh, during the Night Stalker case. They made up evidence. They, they, lied when they testified they did this we did this, and richard all we did was we framed richard ramirez and it was wrong wow so i understand why he's doing it because he's 15 years old has no life sits in front of a computer has no job no source of income and everybody gives him everything he has in life yeah and he can say whatever he wants to because nobody knows nobody sees him nobody's going to touch him yeah, so he's that, that's all he is. He's brave. So this is what he said. This is what I think it is. They're liars. They framed them. They focused the evidence. The judge was in cahoots. It was a conspiracy. And so then he 
He's the shepherd. So then it becomes popular. Hey, let's all join in. Now we're the sheep, and now we follow him. So before you know it, he's got a bunch of people believing he's right. He's got this. He's got that. And I, I heard about it. I, two independent sources told me about it. And all I can do is laugh. You know, I've had people call me up and say, I should be, not call me up, but on social media say, uh, I should be dead. Richard should be alive. And there's a lot of, so all I do, uh, I was asked, I do a podcast uh, with a friend, George Lopez, the actor comedian. Yeah. And I was asked one day on this podcast, what do you think about those people that are doing? I said, I don't care. I'm an old guy that has lived a good life. I'm happy. I'm retired. I'm making a decent income as a retired. I'll never be a rich man, but I've got health insurance and I've got a steady check coming in. I got my house. I got my family. And things. I don't really care. I, I laugh at those guys. They have no life. And certainly words are not going to hurt me at this age. Of course. You know? So it doesn't bother me what they say about all them stuff putting out. I mean, what do you do? You, you read it, and when you you yell at your computer, you know you call them a stupid ass. What are you saying? Right. What are you doing? It doesn't right. it doesn't do any good. Uh, I I try to stay away from most of them, and most of what I read, I just laugh. Um, I do have a question, just um, and if you don't want to answer, but um, when you interview, did you interview Richard Ramirez? You had a chance to talk with him. Yes, he did. Yeah, what? <laughs> I know. Ah, Gina can ah, probably ah. tell me exactly what the conversation was too. But uh, um, what is some what like some of the most interesting or anything that you took away from those conversations? Uh, like, I don't know. You know, uh, first off, probably the most asked question is: Were you nervous or were you afraid going in, knowing that he was satanic? Uh, he was a satanic follower. And I said, absolutely not. If you look at someone like a Tom Brady, and Tom Brady is a married man, kids. I don't even know if he's married, but let's say he's married. Not anymore. Not anymore. He just got divorced. <laughs> just got divorced. <laughs> okay. So before then, he was a married man, kids. He was a dad, a husband, a brother, a son, a buddy. And he'd go to practice during the week and then go out to dinner at night or go to a bar, have a couple of pops with his friends, just an everyday guy, joke and cut around and maybe have time for an extra lady there that maybe that's what led to the divorce. <laughs> uh, <No. laughs> and so, uh, but on Sunday, he goes to the stadium and puts on that uniform and everything else goes out of his mind. He focuses on one thing, game. That's what he's getting paid to do to be a professional, to win the game. The day of Richard's arrest, I was outside the room. I knew he was in the interview room. And I can't wait to get in there with him because everything is thrown out. He's nothing more than human. And I'm a cop on a mission. I know what I've got to do. I know what the game is. So I went in and we sat down and we talked. And as it turned out, Richard is not my buddy. People have asked, hey, I heard you guys are good friends. And he's not my friends. <laughs> what we did was we established a rapport because I'm from the streets, just like Richard. Uh, when I was 17 years old, a cop took me home and told me, told my parents, sign for me, get off the streets here, Linda, dead or in prison. So, I went in the army at age 17. They signed for me. And after going through combat in Vietnam, my whole life got turned around on the tour. I had an appreciation of life. I knew what I wanted to do. But I still remembered I had to talk like an old gangster. And I was Hispanic. So we got along. We had a, we established a rapport. He called me Gil. I called him Rich. My partner, Frank Salerno. Frank Salerno had worked on the Hillside Strangler case, which was another serial case prior to this one. He called Mr. Salerno just that, Mr. Salerno. 
And finally, I told him one day, I said, hey, Rich, God damn, what's wrong? How can we call him Mr. Salerno? And you just <laughs> call me, uh, what's up? I said, did you think he was seven foot tall and hovered? He puts his pants on just like you and I, one leg at a time, Rich. Yeah, that's Mr. Salerno, Gil. You know, so he was articulate. He was not a dummy. He was probably the smartest murderer I've ever interviewed. And uh, he sits there and says, hey, I'm quoting Richard. He said, Gil, I've got an ego that will fill this room. I can tell you everything about serial killers from the time the lions fed the Christians and the lions to the modern day serial killer. He was well read. So, you know, if I took, take away anything, it's... Don't let anybody intimidate you, you know, go in there and just do your job, be a professional. And I've always said, treat people like you'd like to be treated. So not once did Richard ever hear me start cussing at him or yelling at him or slamming my hand down. Uh, hey, it was his bad luck, my good luck. <laughs> and, you know, the two forces met and I won. So it just treat people the way uh, you'd like to be treated. Since the Netflix documentary dropped, I've traveled all over the U.S. talking about the case. Well, I've talked about it before. I mean, I've gone outside the country talking about it, but uh, it's been so active. People watch it, and uh, I've just been all over, and it was all because of the case. And so I'm fortunate. And the night that it dropped, the director called me up. He said, it's going to drop tonight. He said, enjoy the ride. I said, what do you mean? He says, just enjoy the ride. And I now understand what he meant. And I have enjoyed it. Uh, I am enjoying it. Who wouldn't? Uh, I'm not an egomaniac, but if somebody wants to talk to you and they want to share what you've learned, uh, it's important to them, but it's even more important to me to share it with them. Yeah. So absolutely. I thank you. As long as I can do what I will. Oh God. Yeah. No, I, um, I also, I still have this book that I got and you actually signed it for me. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. It's the book and we talked about it. it. It's oh, good. Yeah. It's a great book. Um, I know it's a great book. Not, I didn't do the writing, uh, but there's a lot of pictures in it. That's my kind of book. Yeah, no. Yeah. There's, um, yeah, there's a lot of pictures. Yeah. And it's, it's a good read. It's, it's definitely interesting. And that was a great presentation. Do you do any of that anymore? Uh, back in October, I was in uh, Las Vegas. Oh, and, and I had spoken the year before that in Austin, Texas for a group called crime con and crime con. Uh, if you have the opportunity to, to attend it, it's a fun, fun thing. It's not like comic con where everybody dresses up. Yeah. But it's it's uh, a three day thing uh, seminar where they have people from all over the U.S. It's my that, dream to go there. It's just so damn fucking expensive. Expensive? Oh, it is. It is. Oh my people, god! Some people were paying. I was I was blown out about seventeen hundred dollars yes. for a VIP ticket. Yeah, I because wow. I I actually looked into it and I thought. Oh my God, I have to be looking at something wrong. Like this, like, what am I, am I looking at this wrong? No, I was right. Yeah. 17 for VIP. What that gives you VIP. You don't stand in line for anything. You get, uh, I don't know, a half hour. I don't know how much time you get one-on-one -on -one with me, uh, with the guests, you know, you pick what, what time you want to go your time slot and you get to go in there one-on-one -on -one or three-on-one, -on -one. your friends go in there. Uh, you have a cocktail party with people that are speaking, go out there, glad hand, shake hands, talk to them, get them. They come and sit at your table. Uh, so for $1,700, you got the money. It, it's wow. that's there. I think regular tickets are around 350, 400, somewhere between three and five. Yeah, and it's expensive. maybe we'll have to, we have maybe to once our it. Patreon gets up there, we'll yeah. that, that allows you to. And that allows you to stand in line with a riffraff, you know. Yeah. Along. So I, I went to Austin. I was a late add-on. Uh, I had a friend, a doctor, called him and said, Kill, if you don't mind, I want to submit your name. I think you'd be great at this talking event. And I had no idea what it was about. I said, all right. 
So they submitted my name. Next thing I know, they called me up. They said, here's what we want. What do you so what do you want me to speak about? And they said, well, we want to about you, about your career, how it started, how you ended up on the case. It'll eventually get around to the nice stalker case. Touch on that a little bit, and that'll be it. I said, all right. So I went. I did it. It was successful. And I thoroughly enjoy. And, and see, I hope one of the keys to my continued success right now is I've never forgotten where I came from. Exactly. And so I know what it is to be poor and have what you want to do when you're reaching for dreams or whatever you're doing. So when I go to these things, I'll sit down and I'll drink wine with them. I'll have dinner. I'm, somebody wants to sit down and have dinner with me. We'll sit down and, and have coffee. I talk with everybody and they want to come up. They want autographs. They want to take pictures. Sure. Let's go. You know, and we do that. And the guy that runs it said, see, you get it, Gil. So many of these people that are big stars, you know, they go up there, they speak, and then they have security around them. They take them back to the room or they leave right away. They don't interact. You interact. And so after the first one, uh, they asked me, uh, somebody asked me, the same doctor asked me, are you going to come back next year? I said, well, I don't know. I didn't. They invited me this year. I guess if they asked me to come back, I would. And he says, oh, you, well, you're a rock star around here. They love you. And I said, well, that's good to know. We'll see how much they love me. <laughs> so they did call. Uh, last year's was held in Vegas. And they said, would you do this? And I said, oh, sure. I'll, I'd be more than happy to do it again. And, uh, but what do you want me to speak about this year? He said, well, the same thing you did last year. And I said, the same thing. He said, well, Last year, we had 1,500 attendees. This year, we've already sold over 5,000 tickets. Oh. So that's at least 3,500 that didn't get to see last year. So you talk about the same thing you did last year. I said, okay, and we'll do it. And my wife asked me, what are you, uh, you going to go? I said, yeah, what are you going to talk about? I said, same thing I did last year. She said, what did you talk about last year? I said, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> The night before I was in uh, I was in Vegas, the night before I'm getting ready to speak, and I had a, a terrible time slot. They gave me 9 o'clock in the morning. And in Vegas, I mean, people are out drunk, and people oh, yeah. are partying and gambling. So it's going to be hard to keep them awake, no few that do show. Well, I'm, I'm partaking in a glass of wine the night before with a group attendees and they said so what are you going to talk about in the morning i said same thing i did last year and they said what did you talk about last year i said i don't know i don't remember so what are you going to do tomorrow i said i don't know we'll find out tomorrow morning when i get up on stage <laughs> so i got up on stage and they gave me 45 minutes uh to talk and it's very very professionally run and he sponsors it so they have Producer direct. They have people with timers right there in front of you on stage, keeping you on track. And when I was done, I got a standing ovation. And I had never received a standing ovation like that for speaking. So I said, hold that. Let me get my camera. And I, oh. I, I scanned the group stand, applauding for me. And my wife never goes with me to these things. Uh, and I've explained to her, and she's, she's very much of an introvert. You saw how hard it was just yeah. for me to get a glass of water. <laughs> yeah. uh, she's very much of an introvert. She did not want to be on the uh, documentary. Oh, you she know, and I, No, 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 not at all. And, and she says, I'm I don't want to do she it. Was. And she was. Oh, so am I. And it, it was really good for the documentary. It was good for other wives of married, that are married to cops. Oh, I'm sure. And I said, look, I can't force you to be on there, nor will I. If you don't want to, you won't. But think of the good it'll be for others to see what a wife goes through. And I said, to see he'll ask the question. Do people married as long as you guys have been married? That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, shouldn't happen know. here either. <laughs> <laughs> I call out my friend Tom Brady. See what he is. <laughs> right. She is the glue that has kept everything together for 52 years. 
that's Trust exactly me. what it sounds like. And that that's definitely seen. She is. So she, she finally agreed. She went down there. So she doesn't go with me to Vegas, but I tell her I can't because when I go, when I'm free, it's my time to glad hand people to shake hands, to welcome them, thank them for being so kind, for spending their hard-earned money to come and listen to somebody like me speak. I said, and I have to do that. And I don't want to be sitting there saying, well, I got to go. I got to go to dinner with my wife or I got to spend time with my wife. It's not a vacation. This is work. Yeah. And so that's the way I treat it. So I said, hey, you want to see how what I do? And... They sent me a video of it. I mean, it was professionally videotaped from behind. And I'm up there talking and everything goes well. And when it's done, she sees the room stand up and they're giving me a standing ovation. I said, well, what do you think? And she, her first reply was, do you have to make so much fun of me when you speak? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we love you, Pearl. (laughs) (laughs) So that that was her concern. And And I say stuff. Like, you know, we caught Richard uh, we, uh, before he moved out, uh, before we caught Richard, the week before she moved out of the house, took the kids and she was gone. Yes, and so and that's what I remember. I told her, I, I tell the people, uh, so I tell her at least once a year that we got the wrong guy just to have her pack her stuff and go. <laughs> you know, and, and so other things that I say during this, and it's all, again, Bob Morneau. Bob Morneau used humor to get his points across. Yes. He taught me how to teach. When you're funny, people listen to you. Yeah. When you're dry, they don't. They fall asleep, they yawn, they start private conversation, or they start playing on their phones. Yeah. And so if you're funny, if you keep it humorous, keep it light, they pay attention. uh, I've been asked, a couple of people have, and even George, why don't I go up on stage and do, do a stand up? You know, he'll give me a time slot. He'll get, start off with three minutes, just get up there for three minutes and do it. And when I first uh, expressed that to Darling Pearl, she didn't want me to do it, you know, but I'm because all the speaking I've done over the years, crowds don't intimidate me, you know, I don't get nervous. I just get up there and talk. Yeah. You can tell you're very comfortable at it. But thank you so much for your time. It just and if you if you ever sweaty balls and I would love to take <laughs> <up> to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we could be part of your act if you ever choose to do stand up, you know. There you <laughs> um, do you have any more questions? I don't. Oh. I just appreciate your time. Yeah. I'm like, I have tons, but you're like <laughs> <laughs> That'll take another year. <laughs> um, well, I really, I do appreciate this so much. You taking all this time and I know that you're super busy. Um, do you want to let anybody know where they can find you? If you're working on any projects where we can look forward to seeing you in the near future. They can maybe? find me at the real Gil Carrillo on Instagram and uh, Gil Carrillo on Facebook and they can find me. And how I don't uh, do the, I don't do the are you, what else is out there, right? Right. Um, how often are you on uh George Lopez's podcast? Are you a regular guest uh, with we, him? Or? We started, he called, he reached out to me uh because he's a true crime fanatic. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't he know saw, either until you <laughs> he he uh he saw the documentary three times. A friend of mine called me up and said, hey, I just heard on the radio, Gil, George Lopez said, Gil Carrillo, anybody know him? Give him my phone number, have him reach out. So I did. I left a message. He called me back. Uh, the short version is he invited me for a beer, went down and had a beer with him. That beer turned out to be a podcast. We drink beer on the podcast. That was episode number 11. He does one a week. And we just dumped, I think, 96, maybe uh-huh. 97 will go out today. I started, that was episode uh, 11. We just dropped 96, 97, and I've been on all but three of them with them. Wow. That's oh, awesome. Regular. So it's your podcast too. Yeah. Well, he, yeah. he, on channel five, he did an interview with me. He says he's got his co-host, Gil Carrillo. 
Yeah. Well, that's what, be. yeah, that's what I thought. I was like, I think you might be his co-host by this. Yeah, he, time he, he says he can uh, catch a serial killer. Can't control his, can't control his blood pressure, but he can catch a serial killer. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate this. And I more than anything appreciate you letting us talk to Pearl. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, Hope of course. Well. Good Thank luck you. on the podcast. Yes. Okay. Take Thanks, care. yo. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.